I grew up in the Midlands of South Carolina. The first time I remember learning about Black History Month was maybe somewhat counterintuitively in my eighth grade earth science class. I'm sure I had heard about Black History Month before, but that eighth grade class, science, earth science, was the first time I experienced a sustained month-long focus on black history that included substantive assignments, in this case requiring us to research and present about black scientists. Part of why I didn't have a substantive experience with black history prior to eighth grade is that I didn't have an African-American teacher prior to eighth grade. Of course, any of my white teachers could have emphasized Black History Month in a substantial way, but the truth is, they didn't. Black History Month started in 1926 as a week-long celebration created by the African-American historian Carter Woodson. It took another five decades to be officially recognized at the federal level when President Gerald Ford designated a Black History Week in 1975, and the next year, Ford officially expanded it to Black History Month, calling it, calling, uh, it a moment for the public to, quote, seize the opportunity to honor the too often neglected accomplishments of black Americans in every area of endeavor to honor history. Setting up systems to institutionalize the inclusion of diverse perspectives can make a difference. Indeed, even worse than the story I shared about my lack of early experiences with black teachers and with Black History Month, I'm reminded from studying the life of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. that in the early 1950s, when King was pursuing a PhD in systematic theology at Boston University, a pretty renowned elite place, he never had an African-American instructor, and he never took a course in which a black author was assigned in the entirety of his doctoral studies. One of the ways that I've come to think about this dynamic is the problem is not Black History Month or teaching courses in Black History or womanist theology or Asian American literature or LGBTAIQ ethics or any other identity-centered focus. The problem is much more often the lack of transparency around courses that call themselves simply history, simply theology, simply literature and have every single assignment or close to it from white people or from white men. If that's the case, be honest and let's call the course what it is. Okay, so you took black history and this is rich white heterosexual male history, right? Or rich white heterosexual male ethics. I took quite a few courses like that in my life, I suspect. So they weren't called that, but that's really what they were. When we aren't honest in our labels, the default tends to be that historically privileged groups become perceived as the norm, as basic, as real, and anything else is perceived as this boutique or this deviant um, thing from the norm. Attempts to get inclusive are branded as catering to special interests. I should add that I'm not trying to unduly cast aspersions on professors from decades in the past who didn't have the training that is widely available today and much more widely available today in anti-racism, anti-oppression, multiculturalism. But in the words of Maya Angelou, do the best you can until you know better. And when you know better, maybe you know it, yeah. do better, right? One of the people helping me know better so that I can do better is Dr. Jean Theo Harris. She's a distinguished professor of political science at Brooklyn College. And a few years ago, I shared some insights with you from her brilliant book, The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks. In that book, she debunks the conventional wisdom that Parks was this quiet, humble, dignified, soft-spoken woman who just got tired one day and didn't um, want to um, stand up. This romanticized version of Parks masks the fullness of her life that included nearly 70 years of activism, as well as her involvement in nonviolent activist training and as secretary of her local branch of the NAACP, all prior to her refusal on December 1st, 1985 to give up her seat. And although she recognized the strategic value of nonviolence, 
Hearts' hero, actually, was more Malcolm than Martin. She loved and admired Dr. King greatly, but it was Malcolm X's boldness and clarity, his affirmation of what needed to be done for black people, that made him her champion. Indeed, the Parks family, like many black Southerners, had long kept the gun in their home, even as they participated in the nonviolent movement. As inspiring as the meek and mild Parks of my childhood history lessons were, I find the fuller history of Parks' life to be even more fascinating and compelling. And in the spirit of learning more about the fullness of black history, uh, last year, Dr. Thea Harris published a new book with our own Beacon Press, which is owned by the Unitarian Universalist Association, titled A More Beautiful and Terrible History, The Uses and Misuses of Civil Rights History. And I'm going to restrain myself from going into a tirade of, or I can go back just in most recently to MLK Day and looking how some politicians very cynically used uh, Dr. King's quotes, making me think, that quote, I do not think it means what you think it means, right? <laughs> you know, uh, how we write and tell history matters, and some of the influences behind Dr. Theo Harris's title are shown in two epigraphs at the beginning of her book. The first is from the late uh, Uruguayan writer Eduardo Galeano, uh, Galeano, who wrote, History is a system of power. It's not just telling a story. History is a symptom of a system of power that is always deciding in the name of humanity who deserves to be remembered and who is forgotten. We are much more than we are told. We are much more beautiful. The second epigraph is from the African American writer and social critic James Baldwin, who said, American history is longer, larger, more various, more beautiful and more terrible than anything anyone has ever said about it. I first began to grasp this perspective when I read Howard Zinn's The People's History of the United States. How many of you have read, uh, all, yeah, that place long, but it's really good, uh, commended to you. It tells America's story from the point of view and in the words of America's women, factory workers, African Americans, Native Americans, the working poor, and immigrant laborers. I can understand the appeal of telling romanticized versions of our history that make us feel good about ourselves, but the more I learn about the history of this country, the clearer it is to me that the story of white supremacy in the United States is not merely about the South. It's about the South, but it's not merely about the South. It's not merely about back then, and it's not merely about a few great leaders that made all the difference. Um, systemic racism has always been nationwide, it is still with us today, and the successes of the civil rights movements were due to a legion of folk. Uh, let's briefly explore each of those three points in turn. First, as a native son of South Carolina, I will confess that there are obviously, abundantly, and shamefully a lot to say about the history of racism in the South. But as I learn more about the history of white supremacy in our country, there's also much to be said about systemic racism in the North and in the West as well, both then and now. Dr. King said it this way in 1965. He said, in my travels to the North, I was increasingly becoming disillusioned with the power structures there, who welcomed me to their cities and showered praises on the heroism of the Southern Negroes. Then, when the issues were joined, considering local conditions, the language was polite, but the rejection was firm and unequivocal. So King found that people in the North were glad to hear him tell about how terrible the people in the South were, and, but they didn't want to hear when he talked about parallel things there. Now, they weren't as rude as Bull Connor, but the denial was all the same. Another stark example from earlier that same year in 1965 was when California Governor Edmund Brown learned about the Watts uprisings. He said, California, he said this on the record, California is a state where there is no racial discrimination, end quote. Tell that then to people in the Watts uprisings, tell that a few decades later to Rodney King, who in, our, in an ironic twist of history had been born just a few months prior to the Watts uprisings on April 2nd, 1965. Here's an example of, um, of how we often misremember history today. 
Almost three years ago, in March 2015, there was rightly a lot of focus on the 50th anniversary of the Selma and Montgomery marches. Uh, but there's almost no commemoration a year earlier to mark the 50th anniversary of what was actually the largest civil rights protest of that decade. That protest was not in the South. On February 3rd, 1964, nearly half a million students and teachers stayed home from school to challenge the New York City's Board of Education's refusal to make a plan for comprehensive desegregation of New York City schools. Part of the reason I suspect it was not celebrated is that to this day, New York City has never comprehensively desegregated their schools, which is also true, of course, of many, many other school districts across this country. The difference was framed as, oh, the South has what the lawyers call de jour racial segregation. It's mandated by law. The North just has de facto racial segregation. It's happenstance, right? It just happens to be that way. It's not by intention or design. It's not because of how we designed our, how our real estate agents and how our zoning codes work. And strenuous effort, efforts were made to have the enforcement of the Supreme Court's 1954 decision, Brown versus the Board of Education, apply only to striking down mandated segregation by law without there being any implications for proactively assigning students to public schools in order to overcome racial imbalances, which would, of course, impact the North as well. The failure here is only going halfway. There is an improvement in moving from conscious, aspirational white supremacy, which I sometimes call it, you know, a being the KKK, Virginia, don't have time to get into that, uh, <laughs> to rejecting personal prejudice and explicitly racist, racist laws like Jim Crow segregation. But if you stop there, the tendency is that systems of oppression continue to get um, uh, unconsciously perpetuated if they're not um, systematically and accountably dismantled. Um, so schools continue to be, for the most part, segregated in fact, even if segregation is no longer the mandated law of the land. That's why the language of our UUA principle calls us to consciously and accountably dismantle racism and other systems of oppression. Precisely at this point, aspirations to be colorblind fail us, because we're like, I don't see color. I don't notice that all the white kids are in this school and it's nicer and that the more people of color that are in, children of color in the school, the less funded it tends to be. I don't notice that because I'm colorblind, right? It's not good enough. This dynamic is related to the second point I wanted to be sure to highlight. Too often our histories of social justice are told in the passive voice. Start noticing this. I'm not trying to give you bad flashbacks to English class. Stick with me. Here's what I mean. Too often we're told that leaders get assassinated. Patrons are refused service. Women are ejected from public transportation. So the objects of racism are many, but the subjects are few and left unnamed. In removing the instigators, the historians remove the agency, and in the final reckoning, they remove the responsibility. The problem is not only so, the so-called Southern redneck, who is a conscious, aspirational racist, but also the so-called moderate, who politely or silently refuses to support proactive dismantling of systems of oppression and racial segregation. As Dr. King wrote in his letter from a Birmingham jail, always worth revisiting, the Negro's greatest stumbling block in his stride toward freedom is not the white citizens' council or the Ku Klux Klan, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice. Shallow understanding, he said, from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. Today, the same dynamics are often at play in criticisms of the Black Lives Matter movement. Sometimes even ironically using Dr. King to criticize Black Lives Matter. If you're doing that, you're probably doing something wrong. Uh, sometimes other people echoing the exact words that white moderates said to Dr. King, quote, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I cannot agree with your methods of direct action. I'm of course not saying that either the movement for black lives or any other social movement is above criticism. 
but I'm inviting us to notice the ways that resistance to social change can insidiously repeat itself if we're not careful and self-aware. As the saying goes, history doesn't exactly repeat itself, but it tends to rhyme. The third and final point I wanted to highlight is the problems with the so-called great man version of history that focuses almost exclusively on male leaders to the exclusion of all other people, particularly women, who make often their leadership possible. Among many examples, I'll um, focus for today on Coretta Scott King, who died 13 years ago this past Wednesday. She used to say, I'm often made to sound like the attachment to a vacuum cleaner, <laughs> the wife of Martin, the widow of Martin, all of which I am proud to be, she quickly added, but I am much more than a label. Indeed, she was. When she and Martin Veth first met, she was more politically active than he was. And I've always loved that it was Coretta who rightly insisted that if we're going to get married, my vows will not say to obey you. You know, we're going to say the same thing. She was always a significant force during the Montgomery bus boycott. Coretta was often the one who would answer their household frequently ringing phone. And when they received increasingly frequent hate calls during the night, she started having a thing that she would say every time. She would say, my husband's asleep. He told me to write the name and number of anyone who called to threaten his life so that he could return the call and receive the threat in the morning when he wakes up and is fresh. <laughs> As the movement continued, she spoke up earlier and more forcefully against American involvement in Vietnam than her husband, to give one specific example. Late in 1965, when Dr. King backed out of an address in Washington, D.C. for a peace rally, she kept her commitment to speak. Following her appearance, a reporter asked Dr. King if he had educated his wife on these issues. He told the reporter, she educated me. In less than a month after white supremacists assassinated Dr. King, Coretta Scott King stood on the balcony where he was shot and shared her dream. Where, some, where not some but all of God's children have food, where not some but all of God's children have decent housing, where not some but all of God's children have a guaranteed annual income. She went on to be active in the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa, the protests against the Second Iraq War, and the struggle for LGBT rights, same-sex marriage in particular. There's so much more to say, but I hope I have given you some further insights and tools from moving from the histories we have often received to the histories we need to build the world we dream about, to turn our dreams into deeds. Earlier, I shared the wisdom of Maya Angelou, when you know better, do better. And although I do not think that we or I will ever be perfect, because remember, you are already saved from perfection, right? There is no perfection. You're, we're not going to get there. I do think we're moving in the right direction, and I was honored uh, to be invited recently to the annual meeting of the African American Resources uh, Culture and Heritage Society of Frederick County, where both myself and Lynn Wagner, one of the co-chairs of our UCS Dismantling Racism team, had the opportunity to accept on your behalf a certificate of appreciation from ARCH to this congregation, recognizing our work um, in partnership with them over the past few years. So it says, in recognition of your exceptional support, your assistance has been valuable to our mission to identify, collect, preserve, exhibit, and disseminate the history and culture of African Americans in Frederick County. We'll hang that in the wall at 113. Uh, so from Arch to, to partnering with Arch to helping serve meals each month at Asbury United Methodist, one of the oldest African American churches in Frederick with roots dating back to 1818 to other examples, we are increasingly becoming known outside of these walls for our commitment to building a beloved community and acting for peace and justice. But even as we are becoming better known, if we don't keep moving in this direction of justice, rest assured, we can just as easily become unknown. May we continue our commitment to know better and do better, and I'm grateful to be with you on this journey. In that spirit, please rise and body your spirit. Let's sing together hymn 348, Guide My Feet. <laughs>